Hey, this is Pastor Spencer with Racine Bible Church. You're listening to a sermon from a Sunday morning. The title of our sermon this morning is How to Have Joy and Hope in the New Year. And this is one of those rare little handful of sermons where I actually have an outline. I have a complicated relationship with outlines, but it's in the bulletin and you can uh, fill that in. But as we return to our text in 1 Peter that we've been going through verse by verse, we took a break from that for the Advent series for uh, the, the weeks in December. But as I jumped back into 1 Peter in the last couple of weeks to get ready for this sermon, it just kind of popped up that this little text in verses 3 through 9 is uh, just a, the, the perfect text to talk about what might happen in 2024 and how you can be prepared to have love, faith, hope, and joy in the year ahead. So we'll look together at 1 Peter. We'll read from verse 3 down through verse 9. And as we prepare to read God's word, let's briefly pray again. Lord, for me, your blood was spilled. Lead me. Guide me in your will. This my prayer and this alone. Savior, let your will be done. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How do we have joy and hope in the new year ahead? The way we have joy and hope in the new year ahead, no matter what happens, is first this, point number one, in Christ, we have hope and joy even though. Number one, in Christ, we have hope and joy even though. You know that little phrase, even though? It was the last time you used it. That apple pie was delicious, even though it could have used some vanilla ice cream on top. We had a really nice Christmas, even though my sister was sick and couldn't join us. Fluffy really is a great cat, even though she sheds too much. Or he's a pretty good pastor, even though I wish he was better at hospital visits or didn't preach as long or whatever it is. You see the phrase, even though, or though, in uh, verse 6. In this you rejoice, though, even though, now for a little while, if necessary. Then you see it again in verse 7. So the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. And then you see it again in verse 8. Though you haven't seen him, you love him. Even though you do not now see him, you believe in him. Christians have hope and joy even though, because our hope and our joy, another way of saying even though, is to say Christians have hope and joy because our hope and joy is future oriented. It's future oriented. We have hope and joy even though the present isn't all that we wish it would be. We still have hope and joy even though. To say that in Christ we have hope and joy even though is to say that our hope and joy is future-oriented. It's to say that it is anticipatory. 
It's to say that our hope and joy doesn't arise only from the here and now, but our hope and joy incorporates in its essence the there and then. And this makes our hope and joy in one sense inexplicable and inexpressible. Did you notice the word inexpressible in verse 8? We rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Well, in one, <coughs> in one way it is inexpressible because it's the joy of heaven. But in another way, I like to think of it as like it's inexplicable to people who don't understand that there's more than just this life. It's inexplicable and inexpressible to those who only see by sight. You see, Christians walk by faith. There's this little aphorism. Maybe you've heard it before. It's ancient. I think it's attributed to Aquinas. I don't know who first came up with it. And it goes like this. To the ones who have this hope, no explanation is necessary. To the ones who do not have this hope, no explanation is possible. You see it? To the ones who have this hope, no explanation is necessary. To the ones who do not have this hope, no explanation is possible. It's inexpressible. It's inexplicable. It's hard to explain. And the reason it's hard to explain is because we're explaining it in earthly language to our fellow earthlings, and this hope and joy comes not merely from this earth. It's from beyond. It's from above. In Christ, we have hope and joy even though. Our second point is really a similar way of making the first point, and it's that in Christ, we have hope and joy from the future. In Christ, we have hope and joy even though, and in Christ, we have hope and joy from the future. Our hope looks ahead to our future in Christ. Peter is getting down here, and even in this first chapter, to his main concern, which is that he's writing to Christian believers who are suffering and who see more suffering on the horizon. And he's telling them how to have hope and joy even if you're suffering and even if you look ahead and it seems that the suffering won't lessen but rather will become more severe. How do you have hope and joy even then? This is how is because in Christ, we have hope and joy from the future. Because in Christ, we have a hope that goes beyond our trials. Notice in verse 6 that we do have troubles for a little while. For a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. I like to contrast verse 6 with verse 3. Verse 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We've already been born again, and we have this living hope that's a forever hope, even though now for a little while we suffer. You see, we have regeneration and the promise of heaven already given to us. Verses 4 and 5 say we're looking ahead to a reward that's imperishable and undefiled. We have a hope and joy that comes from the future. You ever think about this? When Christ comes back, that will be the end of our suffering. When Christ comes back, it'll be the end of our suffering. But that's not good enough. It's not like... Christ comes back and our suffering ends and so we go back to what? Neutral? We go back to what? Normal? We go back to what? Having a pretty good day? When Christ comes back, not only does our suffering end, but we're more than normal, we're more than fine. We have a future glory that is, uh, that is in, in the words of verse 8, a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Filled with glory means that the shining radiance of God himself, which the heaven of heavens cannot uh, contain, that that's the glory that's ours when Christ returns. And, and that's shining in our lives now by faith in, the, in his future return. We have it by faith in him. Doesn't verse 8 remind you of... Uh, 
2 Corinthians 4, 17, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Or doesn't it remind you of Romans 8, 18? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed in us, in us, to us, in us, when Christ returns. We will share in Christ's glory forever. We're in the already and the not yet. We muddle through these days with our eyes on that day. Every Christian is in the process of becoming who you are. You've been born again. You have this inheritance. You're becoming like Christ. And you're, you, you are saved, but you are being saved. And then one day, perfectly and finally, you'll be gloriously saved. And these verses are saying that we have a hope and a future that is sure and certain. But the reason we didn't, or perhaps the reason you didn't, have hope and joy in 2023, or perhaps the, the first bad thing that happens in January of 2024, the reason that you'll struggle to have hope and joy is because the future gets eclipsed by the present. And your hope and your joy comes back when the present gets eclipsed by the future. The problem with the folks that, that we try to help, the problem with the folks that Peter was trying to help is our perpetual problem. The immediate overshadows the ultimate. The immediate in the foreground keeps the ultimate in the background. But as long as the immediate is dominant in the foreground, then the, the ultimate, which shouldn't be in the background, the ultimate should be in the foreground, but we, we lose it. Suffering and salvation. Suffering is the immediate. Salvation is the ultimate. And Peter's thesis is to rightly handle the immediate, you have to understand the ultimate. To rightly perceive the immediate and not lose your perspective, to rightly perceive the immediate and not lose your perspective, you have to have a clear vision of the ultimate. And that's why our hope and joy in Christ is even though, and that's why our hope and joy in Christ is from the future. This is a description of what it means to be a Christian. Remember the, the sermon title, How to Have Hope and Joy in the New Year. There is a way to have hope and maybe we could say joy or we could say happiness in the new year that doesn't require Christ. I'm up here talking to you about how to have Christian hope and joy. There are lots of ways to have hope and happiness that don't involve Christ. Peter's talking about how to have Christian hope and joy. These verses show you how to handle troubles as a Christian. I've known, I'm not making this up, perhaps you have too. I have known worldly unbelieving people who have encountered trouble well. They've been sacrificial, They've been loving through it. They've been others-oriented. I've known unbelievers who generously help others through their trouble. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's a good part of, 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 of humanity, to be in the workplace and to collect money from folks and to help your neighbors when they need help, whether, whether you or they are a Christian or not. That kind of help is good as far as it goes, as far as neighborly love. But what makes hope Christian hope? And what makes love Christian love? Notice in our text, it's because you've been born again, verse 3. It's because you have an inheritance in heaven, verse 4. It's because God's power is guarding you, verse 5. It's because you have supernatural joy, verse 6. It's because you have faith, verse 7. It's because you love Jesus, verse 8. And it's because you know, verse 9, that you're saved. This is Christian hope and joy. That's what it is. So in Christ, we have hope and joy, even though in Christ, we have hope and joy from the future. And number three, 
In Christ, we have hope and joy through faith. That's what we're talking about, really. Number three, in Christ, we have hope and joy through faith. How do love, hope, and joy all work together to keep us going? This is how. Find the word faith in this text. As you look, as you look down, you see it in verse five, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. And you see it in verse seven. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, and you see it in uh, verse 8, you see the word love, and then in verse 8, you see the word believe, which is a synonym for faith. Faith. You love Jesus because you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. So notice, faith and love contribute to our joy and our hope. Faith and love contribute to our joy and our hope. When we know Jesus, then we're supposed to love Jesus. And when we love Jesus, we have joy and hope in Jesus. Faith and love work together. We've talked before, haven't we? Have you ever thought about this? The difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus the difference between a nagging sense that you know that you should love Jesus and and just the heart aflutter with the fact that you love Jesus from your heart. Knowing and loving. Knowing and loving. Don't you think, I, I wonder if you ought to think about this in the new year. You ever know someone, or maybe you are this someone, that for months, weeks, months, maybe years at a time, you try to read the Bible and it just doesn't take. Or for weeks or even months at a time, you keep going to church, but it just doesn't seem to do any good. How come it seems to work for some people and it doesn't seem to work for other people? Well, I'm sure there are multiple correct answers to that inquiry, but... I do know that uh, one of the things that 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9 convinces me of is that love makes knowledge operational. Love makes knowledge energetic unto life change. It's love. It's love. Because he says there in verse 8, though you haven't seen him, you love him. And though you don't now see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that's inexpressible. It's faith working by love that fills the heart with joy and hope. So we teach and we preach here in the church. You read the Bible in your home. You're, you're in these relationships with folks in your ABF and in a Bible study. But it's that knowledge coupled with love that makes the thing work. So picture it like this. The, here, are, here are train tracks. And the train tracks are going, verse 9, the train tracks are going to ultimate salvation in Jesus. Salvation isn't just getting to heaven. Salvation is being in Jesus. Heaven wouldn't be heaven without Jesus. So the ultimate place we're headed is Jesus. The presence of Jesus, to love Jesus, to enjoy Jesus. That's where the, that's where the tracks are going. So we picture it as a train track headed to Jesus, the ultimate joy of salvation. Now, the two lines, you know, or the, the, the tracks, or the two wheels that are rolling down the tracks are like, call it joyful hope and love. Those are the two wheels, joyful hope and love. And what I'm saying is the axle that connects those two is faith, is faith, is faith. Joyful hope and love, and the common axle that connects them is faith. And it says we have faith in Christ Faith in the miracle of our regeneration, verse 3. Faith in the promise of our inheritance, verse 5. Faith in God's power to keep us, verse 5. It's that faith that keeps us rolling. And faith is how we overcome the immediate suffering with ultimate salvation hope. The ultimate is Jesus. And as we see Jesus and glory in his presence then it's by faith that we roll through in joy and in hope. So my challenge to you is that in 2024, figure out 
I'm not going to answer this question. I'm going to tell you, you got to figure it out. <laughs> figure out how to feed your faith with more nutrients than you've ever fed it before. And figure out how to starve your doubt so that it's more emaciated than it's ever been. Figure that out. This is how the process works. Joy, hope, faith, all because of Christ. Notice that verse 7 says that it's through faith. The tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, is found a result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice that what needs strengthened is your faith. What needs to be strengthened is your faith. God sends or allows trials in order to strengthen your faith. What do trials do? The answer, trials strengthen your faith. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what they're designed by God to do. Trials strengthen your faith. How do they do that? Trials strengthen your faith by forcing you to trust God more. Remember the immediate and the ultimate? How do trials strengthen your faith? Trials strengthen your faith because in a trial, either your faith is weakened because you are overwhelmed by the immediate or your faith is strengthened because even though the immediate is hot and excruciating, you, your faith is strengthened as you see the ultimate and you, and you go through that process of endurance and that crucible of suffering. How do trials strengthen our faith? By forcing us to trust God more. How do trials strengthen our faith? They force us to tighten our grip on the things we can never lose. One of the worst trials is losing something that you didn't want to lose. How, does, how do trials strengthen our faith? Trials strengthen our faith because they force us to grip on the things that we can never lose. And those are very few, very, very few. How do trials strengthen our faith? Trials strengthen your faith by burning away your self-confidence. You ever have that experience of watching somebody else go through something and melt down? You're like, that would never happen to me. <laughs> and then it happens to you. And the puddle you melt down into is stickier and stinkier than the puddle they did. <laughs> trials have a way of burning away our self-confidence. And trials certainly have a way of showing us how shallow and hollow all of our substitute saviors are. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Jesus alone. Trials strengthen our faith. The Scottish pastor Samuel Rutherford is famous for the saying... Um, he, he would always say, I have long taken it to be a truth that Christian graces grow best in winter. That Christian graces grow best in winter. He goes on to explain, he says, I think it is the Lord's wise love that he feeds us by our hungers and he makes us fat by our wants and desertions. Christian graces grow best in winter. Faith grows in the tough times. Faith grows in the lean times. So how do you have joy and hope in the new year? By faith, by strengthening your faith. And in an effort to, to, to help you make it down that track a little further and a little better than maybe you did last year, uh, the second thing I want to do with a, with a brief moments that remain for us is give you some practical takeaways in how you can do this. How do you do it? What are the steps that you can take? What are the, the measures that you can take, the, the measures you can make or the resolutions you can make? So number one, here's pastoral advice basically. Number one, slow down and ask yourself three good questions. How to have faith and hope in the new year when you encounter troubles and trials. Number one, slow down and ask yourself three good questions. Slow down and ask yourself three good questions. If you and I have had the the privilege and joy of working together through some difficulties in your life, 
whether in my office or over at Culver's, you you've maybe have been asked these three questions by me because of these, these three questions have served me for decades and decades. I first learned them in a biblical counseling class way, way, way back long ago. And the three questions are, what do you feel? What do you think? What do you know? Those are the three. What do you feel? What do you think? What do you know? When you encounter trouble and trial, if you, if you want to have joy and hope, slow down and ask yourself those three questions. Question number one, what do I feel? Uh, admit what you feel. I feel afraid. I feel sad. I feel like this whole thing stinks. I feel like this suffering is very grievous. I feel that, that, that this isn't right, whatever it is. Because what you feel is what you feel. So admit it. Go to the Psalms of lament. Go, to the, go, go, go throughout the book of Psalms. The, the, the psalmist is, is honest with God about what he feels. So open up about what you feel. What you feel is important. And being honest about what you feel is important. And would you allow me to put it like this? What you feel is important, though what you feel is not ultimate. Your feelings matter, though your feelings can never be your moral compass. They matter, but they're not your moral compass. Your feelings matter, and they have a big effect on your life and your experience. But your feelings are not the guide for your life nor are they a trustworthy lifeline for your experiences. This doesn't, what we feel gets to the definition of joy and rejoicing. Verse six, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while if necessary, you're grieved. How do you rejoice while you grieve? Well, joy must be something other than a feeling, see? Verse eight, though you haven't seen him, you love him. Though you don't now see him, you believe in him. (coughs) And you rejoice with joy that's inexpressible. What is this joy? It can't be a circumstantial feeling of delight. And this joy also isn't a denial of your feelings of sadness. What you feel is what you feel, and your emotions matter, and they affect you deeply. So this joy isn't a feeling of happiness necessarily, and this joy isn't pretending that you feel good when you don't. What is this joy? This joy... The joy that's mentioned in verses 6 and 8, taken in context of 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 10, this joy is a deep down confidence in God and God's promises. This joy is a deep down faith in God, who God is. It's a long-term trust in God's final good plan. So three quick questions. First, what do you feel? Second, what do you think? When you're going through trouble, when you're trying to help someone else who's going through trouble, ask them what they feel. Second, ask them what they think. And they may honestly say, well, I think that the situation that I'm in isn't fair. And I think that other people are getting treated better than I am. And I think that I've been in this situation too long. And I think that I did pray and I did read my Bible and I did put extra money in the plate at church and I did all those things and they didn't work. Whatever you think, what you think is what you think and what you think is important. Maybe, maybe you ought to make it your resolution in 2024 to think about what you think about. Maybe you spent too much time in 2023 just thinking about things. What if, what if in 2024 you started to think about what you think about? What if in 2024 you started really paying attention to what you pay attention to? It would make a difference. What you think is critically important And what you think is also critically incomplete. It's important, but it's incomplete. You're not omniscient. Far from it. And what you think accurately represents what you see, but there's so much more that you don't see than that you do see. You never see the big picture. You never see the whole thing. So be realistic about what you think, but then tell yourself that what you think isn't your guide. It's just what you think. And begin to change and conform what you think along the lines of the third question. What do you feel? What do you think? Third, what do you know? This is where we get down to Christian faith, to belief in the Word of God. What do you know? 
What do you know? You could, you, could, you could just take a piece of paper and write what you know just on verses 3 through 9 of 1 Peter 1. There's a whole lot more in the Bible, but I, I bet you that alone would get you through 2024. Just the things that you know based on those simple verses. What do you know? Verse 3, you know that Christ is risen. Do you know that or not? If you know that Christ is risen then you, you will become in Christ a person for whom the ultimate eclipses the immediate. You know that Christ is risen. And not only that, but you know, verse 3, that because Christ is risen, you now have a living hope that, verses 4 and 5, can never be stolen from you, you can never lose, and no one can ever take it from you. Amen. And that's just the, the, a couple of phrases from the first couple of verses. What do you know? What do you know? The, the absolutely crucial point of Scripture meditation is not that you just need to get more gold stars on your chart because you do more Bible than the next person. The crucial point of Scripture meditation is that throughout life, whatever happens, when you begin to ask, what do I feel, what do I think, what do I know, then you begin to become someone who has Christian feelings and Christian thinking. And, and, and God honoring rock solid knowledge. So number one, slow down and ask yourself three good questions. Number two, speak to yourself with the words of the Psalms. Speak to yourself with the words of the Psalms. Talk to yourself and don't trust yourself. Tell yourself what to tell yourself. You need to quit listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. When you get tripped up and you lose your hope and you lose your joy, it's because you're listening to yourself rather than talking to yourself with the words of the Psalms. You gotta tell yourself to stop floating along on your moods and reactions and emotions and, and, and thoughts. And instead you need to speak scriptural truth to yourself. There's, there's this, this marvelous, there, there's these marvelous two words in the Psalms. The first word is just one letter, and the second word is just four letters. And it's, and it's this phrase, I will, I will. I got a thick book on my shelf, and the title of the book is The I Wills of the Psalms. And this author just, just takes every time the word I will shows up in the Psalms and kind of explains it. Crucial words, I will. That's talking to you, I will. I will. That's talking to yourself. I will. I will be glad in the Lord. I will hope in the Lord. I will meditate on the Lord. I will, I will, I will. In the Psalms of Lament, remember, what do you feel? What do you think? The Psalms of Lament are super honest about how we feel and super honest about the crazy thoughts that we think. And in every one of the Psalms of Lament, in every one of the Psalms of Lament, you have this glorious word, but, B-U-T, or you have this glorious word, yet, Y-E-T. The, the complaint is there, the lament is there, and then always in the Psalms of Lament, you have this, yet, I will remember. Yet, I will see the Lord in the land of the living. Oh, my enemies may kill me, but I will see the Lord in the land of the living. So you got to talk to yourself with the words of the Psalms. This is, this is, uh, this is the, 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 the best way to take, to take self-control seriously, I think, is some form of this, this scripture meditation where you begin to talk to yourself with God's script rather than the script of your, uh, of your unmediated moods that, that are going who knows where. So number two, talk to yourself with the words of the Psalms. Number three, Sit under the preaching of the word in church. Sit under the preaching of the word in church. Get yourself to church and never miss corporate worship. Well, I don't feel like singing today. Excuse me? The days when you don't feel like singing, you don't have to believe me, but I'm right. The days that you don't feel like singing are the most important days for you to sing the glories and praises of the risen Savior. The most important days for you to do that. This is how you stay out of the cave and you, and you dwell with your good shepherd. 
He's always there. He's always good. But if you just turn your back and refuse to praise, then you just go in that cave and you're like, I hate my life because it's soggy and moldy and damp in here. And God's like, get out of the cave. I'm here. Praise me. Seek me. Sit under the preaching of the word in the church. When you don't feel like listening to the preaching is the time when you need it the most. When you don't feel like singing is the time you need to sing the most. You can sing the Psalms of Lament. I'm not saying you have to make up a song that's, you know, you, you, but the, those Psalms of Lament, you just sing those out. They'll be there. Sit under the preaching of the word in the church. Put yourself under teaching that will correct you and redirect you. And of course, number four, surround yourself with godly relationships. Surround yourself with godly relationships. This, this is why we're, we're, it should be a mantra around here. You, sh- you should hear it so much that you could complete the, the phrases that we say from up here. But this is why if, if you're going to be a covenant member of Racine Bible Church, you got to be here both hours, three hours the whole morning. You got to be here in corporate worship for the preaching and the singing and the praying. And you have to, have to, have to be in ABF, Adult Bible Fellowship, for those relationships. That, that prayer accountability, that encouragement. You got to surround yourself with those godly relationships. These verses tell us how to have hope and joy in the new year. Let me just tell you one more thing. You will encounter trouble and trial in 2024. And when you do, probably you'll be tempted to think something like this. You might not say it out loud because it's not a good Christian thing to say, but you'll be tempted to think, man, why is God doing me like that? If God loved me more, he wouldn't do me like that. If God loved me more, this bad stuff wouldn't happen. And the answer to that is, those trials are the furthest thing from proving that God doesn't care about you. Think of a, an estate. We rewatched the, the Pride and Prejudice over the Christmas holiday. You know, think of those, those huge estates. There's this, this massive garden. And then way out at the end of the estate, there, there's a wooden fence. And then there's the wilderness or the, the, the English countryside. And you know, the owner of the estate, he just lets the wilderness grow. He doesn't do anything to it, except he goes in there every now and then and shoots a deer or whatever. But the gardens... The owner of the estate is working on those gardens every day. Why? Why? Because this is where he dwells. This is where he lives. This is where he wants to walk in the cool of the evening. Beloved, as you go through trials and tribulations, it's the opposite of the case that these things are happening to you because God doesn't care about you. You are not the wilderness that he doesn't touch. You are his beloved garden. He wants to dwell in you. And this is why, though our troubles and trials hurt and grieve us, they don't take away our joy and our hope because we know that God is good and that Jesus is ours. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, have mercy on your precious lambs. Lead them beside still waters. Give them the confidence that you are the good shepherd. Then we pray for the year ahead. We pray that when there are opportunities to stand for you and for righteousness, and we know those opportunities will cost us, make us able to pay the price gladly and with joy for you and for your cause. Lord Jesus, Help us not to lose our joy. Help us not to lose our hope. Help us to to overcome that immediate sense of the, 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 the present events eclipsing everything and strengthen our faith in you and our faith in your promises. Lord Jesus, strengthen us to be the people you're calling us to be so that your truth and your light and your love would radiate out of our lives. 
This we ask in Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. To find out more about our ministry, contact us at racinebible.org. Thank you for listening.